Shalea Marathon Show. Sponsored by Step Finance, your go-to DeFi portfolio manager on Solana. Luno, if you're just getting into Bitcoin, it's the perfect place to start. Hey guys, and welcome back to the Leia High Plan Show. The reason I'm smiling from ear to ear right now is because that's a new intro, and I think that was really cool. You can let me know if you like it. Um, so today's gonna be really interesting. We're talking about Bitcoin mining. Um, I think it's a pretty hot topic given everything that's going on in the world. Um, but before we delve into this, this particular episode, actually all of these episodes um, are powered by Icon Plus Capital. So they're a VC firm. So definitely go check them out. And it's also sponsored by BlockFi, who offer really great interest rates, um, especially on stable coins. So I use them. I love them. So definitely go check that out. So like I said, today we are talking about Bitcoin mining. Now, I am joined with somebody who um, was kind of on the front page of the Daily Mail um, and there was a really clickbaity headline. Um, so we're going to find out how accurate this is. But this is the headline. JP Barrick drops out of college and turned $1,400 investment into $1.3 million in a month through Bitcoin mining. JP, is that true? Welcome to the show. Is it true? Well, I did drop out of college. I did start with a small amount of money. I used to run a Lego robotics camp when I was in high school and use that money to buy cryptocurrency in 2013 and beyond. And I did end up making over a million dollars. I wouldn't directly correlate it and I didn't do it in a month. But uh, yes, some of those things are true. The media loves to take the story and make it, you know, the headline, even though you know, they take things out of context. But at the end of the day, Bitcoin mining has brought me wealth. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's always taken out of context, but I'm so excited to go into this with you because we were sort of talking backstage. And I think that right now mining is super hot just because it is so affected by the geopolitical landscape. But before we do delve into that, can you just tell us, you know, about your background, what you do, um, just so people know, you know, why you're basically the expert to talk about this? Yeah. So I got into the mining space in 2016, got into Bitcoin in 2013 when I was in high school, uh, went to college for computer science, dropped out of school to start the company called Mining Store. And Mining Store has been focused on bringing Bitcoin and cryptocurrency mining to retail and institutional investors across the space and basically making the mining space more accessible. Um, and I, I what was the original question? I got into this because of what? Yeah, no, no, no. Well, the question was, who are you? But that, that's oh, helpful. So, mining store. No, well, tell us what's mining store, just so people can fully understand. Yeah, so, so mining store is a white glove solutions to get into Bitcoin mining. People who have no idea how to get into mining or have really don't want to have to deal with power bills, don't have to deal with uh, hosting contracts, don't have to deal with replacement parts. And mining store provides all those services. And then in addition, we're working with influencers to launch their own mining companies and make mining more accessible by dropping the price of getting into Bitcoin mining from $10,000 or $9,000 to buy one miner to actually like $100 now. So we're trying to make oh, wow. it super accessible and available so anyone can invest in, in a mining operation. Okay, so we're going to talk about that because I want to start mining because I unfortunately don't. So we're going to get into that. Um, but how did you then hear about mining back was it in 2017 it's like how did you do that in college so in 2016 i was a senior in high school and i was into crypto i had my own mining rig in my parents basement you know just gpu rigs i ended up buying some butterfly labs miners that took forever to get shipped they were like some of the first asics built here in the united states and then um i raised about a hundred thousand dollars from family and friends from my grandparents put up some money myself uh, from my That's uncle. A lot of money. Yeah, especially as you know, someone who was 17 years old, maybe 18 years old, somewhere in that range. So uh, I took that capital and bought 300 graphics cards, started mining in a old um, kind of like area where they made coats and made um, clothing and in Graham, North Carolina. And then that's where the mining store started. It was just a Shopify store. We actually were selling the equipment. We were building custom rigs for people and shipping it to them. The problem is when they arrived at the site of this other individual that bought it on eBay, they were just so broken. The mail just destroyed them every time. Oh, wow. And so we kind of learned like what we could and couldn't do and how we could sell miners online more effectively. And from there, I've just been iterating on the process to now where, you know, we're dropping the barrier of entry and using new, uh, new regulatory frameworks in order to, in order to do that. But how did you know what you're doing? Because it's so early. I mean, even raising $100,000 is wild. I mean, for me, I've always been an entrepreneur. So I mentioned the Lego Robotics Camp before. Uh, my dad, when I was younger, he was like, if you want to go to a summer camp, you have to pay for half of it. And so let's go sell yeah. strawberries to our neighbors. And so we walked around to the neighbors and said, hey, do you want to buy strawberries? I'm going to go pick them. And so my dad just kind of uh, helped me grow and be an entrepreneur and also gave me the... Um, 
I guess, the confidence to believe that you can do whatever you put your mind to and that you have the ability to, you know, to grow a business and you have the ability to make money. And it's not something that's only reserved for people that are educated. And in my, you know, my sense, I was only in high school. And since then, I've learned a lot by A-B testing and then by, by running a company, just by doing it. I think that's such um, an important life lesson, um, you know, that it's just sort of what your parents instill in you. Um, because so many people sort of have this mindset that you have to come from, you know, endless amounts of money to be so-called privileged. But I, I really think that having good parents that instill um, a really healthy work ethic in you um, and also just like not just work ethic, but like mentality within you is the most privileged thing you could have. 100% agree. The mentality that I was able to receive from my parents and the support when it was like, okay, this is how you get insurance. Like my dad was like, hey, here's my insurance broker um, that I use. And I, you know, I was like 16, 17, trying to figure out how to get insurance. So this is, you know, it's a process and you learn. And throughout that whole experience, I was able to hire people. I was able to hire my friends, fire all my friends, hire people that got paid $100,000 a year and thought that was like the biggest expense ever, you know, rent yeah. a building and having to pay for the rent of my building for the whole year up front because they were like, there's no way we're going to rent this to you. I was like, well, what happens if I pay for it all now? They're like, okay, we'll rent it to you. So like getting through uh, those stages and be able to meet great people and connect with great people in the community and, and still like today to be able to say like, hey, I know that person. And when I see them in public, like we still recognize each other. We still talk and chat, which is it's an amazing feeling. And so it's not, you don't, you're on this journey by yourself. You're on this journey with the community and you're here. I believe we're all here to build, you know, the future of the world and future of finance. Just briefly, how was it hiring and firing your friends? Well, I hired all my friends in 2017 with mining Such store. It was like six guys in a room doing phone calls. You know, it was great when we were making money, but then like things started getting bad and Bitcoin mining became unprofitable and Bitcoin started crashing. And so my friends, like I had to let them all go eventually at some point and they, uh, I've learned a lot since then, but I learned that like you don't want to hire your friends uh, because they're friends. They're not working people. They're not your business partners. It's better to go out in the in the environment and find the right people fit for the job versus just like, you know, hey, we're going to all jump on this boat together and see where we go. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, <laughs> pleasure and business. Keep them separate. Um, so the whole idea is to make mining accessible for the average person, essentially. Is that correct? That's correct. We'll world class mining facilities and make mining accessible for everyone. So how do you do that? So that's the question I, you know, I've been asking myself for, for, for years now. And like we've thought about NFTs, I, we've thought about um, other routes where um, you could like buy a portion of a Bitcoin miner and have it run for you. But what we realized at the end of the day was there is a really cool new regulation out there called regulation crowdfunding. And so we launched a product called BitVault, which allows for any influencer to start their own mining company. And we, uh, mining store, provide the services required to come keep those miners running, keep them operational. And the influencer basically makes content about it, similar to like a sponsor. And they end up owning about 20% of the company. So the influencer and ourselves own 20% and we sell 80% of it to the fans. So the fans put in their dollars, you take an 80-20 split similar to a hedge fund, and you're able to raise up to $5 million legally in the United States from, un, from um, unregistered investors or unaccredited investors. So this means we can take $100 investments from anyone, not only U.S. citizens, but anyone in the world. And you don't even need to be a U.S. citizen to launch one. You can be you know, a UK citizen and you can launch a Reg CF still. So we're super excited to bring Bitcoin mining to the communities of all these influencers and to allow anyone to get into mining because we all know that $8,000 is way too expensive for most of the population. Yeah, it really is. Um, but then that sort of brings you on to like my next question, which I often hear about, um, is the idea that you know it's difficult to do it on your own. So you end up getting these large mining pools um, and then they become centralized. Um, so are there any concerns there how do we tackle that what would your response be to that yeah so the mining pools um the first pool that ever came out was slush pool and they existed because they the network was getting too hard as you mentioned and so what we're focused on um or what the mining industry is focused on is getting steady payouts so mining pools are necessary to provide steady payouts to smaller miners anyone who has less than 25 megawatts is probably doing a pool mining and 25 megawatts is 
hundreds of millions, like a hundred million dollars worth of equipment today if it's all new generation. So it's very, very expensive. You're not going to be able to not join a pool if you're a consumer. Um, regarding the centralization of pools, I think that was definitely a problem more in 2017. Um, today, we have a lot of pools, a lot of great pool operators and a lot of people um, optimizing and innovating in the pool space. Um, in the future, I don't think we'll necessarily need mining pools. I think that mining pools are going to be uh, like become a layer two solution and will be built into some like blockchains or other uh, software protocols um, and they'll be decentralized. But we're, we're getting there. Yeah, and I think that right now mining is at this really awkward stage because we've had, well, in the US, you, you know, you had the infrastructure bill where you didn't have sort of that clarification on, you know, the term what's a broker. Um, and then you've, so you've got like this increased regulation and then you've also got the fact that like, everything geopolitically is such a mess, whether it's, you know, China, whether it's, you know, ch um, people moving from, miners moving from China to Kazakhstan and the internet getting shut down in Kazakhstan because of a protest and then miners setting up in Ukraine and then everything going on. So we did see, you know, the China shutdown, of course, obviously affect the hash rate. There was a recovery, but the price obviously still took a hit. So how are you navigating that right now? Just the initial kind of, helping people set up shop and also just knowing where to set up shop. So with Bitcoin mining, it's the only real thing on the, the Bitcoin blockchain that physic that has a physical existence in the real yeah. world. Like nodes, yes, they do exist, but they're very easy to run. You run them on a server. There's plenty of servers all over the world and people don't have an issue getting access to them. When it comes to the mining servers, there are no operations like them. They're deploying thousands of them. It's a ton of power in a concentrated area. And you brought up the geopolitical risk. For ourselves, we focus on the United States. We've looked at we've looked at doing projects in Ukraine at nuclear power plants. We've looked at doing projects in in, uh, in Uganda, in Nigeria, in South in Brazil, in Canada. We've always stuck to the U.S. because of the amount of abundant clean energy we have here. So the United States is one of the biggest um, developers of clean energy and is pouring the most amount of capital out of most countries into clean energy. So we have all of this clean energy going in Texas and in the Midwest, and that energy actually can't get to anyone uh, because we're building it away from population centers. So that provides a great opportunity for Bitcoin miners to come in and to arbitrage that energy and to sell it to the Bitcoin network and buy it for pennies on the dollar, literally two cents, three cents uh, per kilowatt hour. So when it comes to geopolitical risk, we haven't uh, gone into those other countries due to those issues because um, financiers, insurance companies, they all like the U.S. much better as a reg as a regime to you know trust. And we're seeing that the U.S. is respecting mining, and it's also very hard for the U.S. to do a blanket ban of mining like another country could because of the different regulations regarding power usage and the different regulatory bodies and state, local, and federal that regulate how the grid operates and how uh, what type of energy you can use and how energy consumption works. But obviously, I mean, just from an entrepreneurial standpoint, I imagine that eventually you would like to go global. Is that right? So going global to me looks like going global on the software level, right? So yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. I, so, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would love to build, you know, we're working at how do we build large power plants in these other countries. But at the end of the day, like the majority of mining machines um, will be running at one site. And you can fit, for example, an 80 megawatt site, we can fit 23,000 servers there. That 20, those 23,000 servers at $100 a piece, those could be owned by, let's say, 2.3 million people all across the world. Yes. So yeah. that's the goal is to scale with software and keep the infrastructure in the U.S. in places where we know for a fact that the representations we're making online, we're going to be able to follow through over the five-year period. In terms of, you know, these bands that we're seeing globally, just outside of, you know, your infrastructure and everything that you're building – how do you feel that that is going to affect the network? Because we obviously saw what happened with China. Um, I know, I know, obviously, um, the price recovered and so did the hash rate. But, you know, it did take some time. And then the same, you know, it's concerning about the miners in Russia and Kazakhstan. And I think I also actually, not Kazakhstan, sorry, Ukraine. Um, and I think I also read, again, I, don't quote me on this because I can't remember exactly what it was. But I think I read that they're shutting off access to the internet outside of Russia. So they're only going to be, so they're only going to have access to Russian internet, but even a VPN won't be enough to get around that. So, you know, how, how, how does that affect the network? I mean, I have no idea how the Russian miners are going to pull that one off and get and figure out how to do it. Obviously uh, there's the internet and then there's 
uh, other layers of communication. I don't know if the Bitcoin nodes can communicate without the internet um, on their own protocol. So I'm, I'm un I know they use the internet as a backbone, but I'm unsure how that's going to affect uh, the port. You know, I think the port that all the nodes are on uh, from transmitting information and then exact, exactly right, affect the stratum server or the servers connecting to the mining pools. Um, well, we'll see. I think they have five days. That's what I heard yesterday. I was like, damn, five days yeah. to, to make a whole new internet out here. Um, and I hope that, you know, I hope that the miners who put up the money, who invested infrastructure, right? You know, this is, this isn't just like building a website where you can move it to another server. You're putting up exactly. millions of dollars of physical hardware. You're putting up millions of dollars of labor, electrical components. So these are real people's livelihoods that could be, you know, in jeopardy uh, because of this, these Bitcoin mining slash internet bans that are occurring in Russia. Yeah, I mean, does it concern you that, you know, you've you've chosen the US because you feel that it is, you know, a safe place, um, you know, it's somewhat stable kind of. Um, kind of. Does it concern you that mining could become centralized in the US, you know, the same way we used to have those kind of accusations about China? I think that it concerns me if there's any one country that has more control of 50% of the hash rate and could dictate um, a, you know, some sort of, protocol change or dif yeah. not necessarily protocol change, but dictate uh, blocks, you know, reorgs or something that the miners would have to comply with to approve transactions in only US based blocks. So I, I, I like decentralization. And I think that we're going to be con continuing to build decentralization layers on the pool level. And if that starts to happen, then as a miner, you'll be able to connect to a pool where they have no idea where you're coming from. Um, but at the end of the day, we all have uh, legislators and regulatory bodies we have to, you know, listen to and uh, not not avoid, but like follow the regulations they put out. And we want to have productive conversations with them. At the end of the day, we're here to challenge how energy consumption and the energy discussion is handled in the United States. Uh, Mining Store, one of our goals is to frame the energy conversation of Bitcoin energy is energy well spent. So you're, when you're using it on Bitcoin mining, it's not like you're going to going to waste when you we, talk, we don't talk about how much energy we're using when we're traveling on a plane or when we're driving to work or when we watch Netflix. No, we don't have that conversation because it doesn't it doesn't have a direct correlation. Bitcoin mining has been selected as the energy behemoth and like taking up all the world's power. But the reality is, is it's very small. Like if, if you look at the concrete production and how much CO2 that emits and how much energy concrete production uses, we're not saying we shouldn't build roads anymore because it's too bad for the environment. You know, we're continuing to do that and continue to expand as society. Yeah, I think there are two points there. It's well, it's the whole idea that like Bitcoin mining is a net positive for the environment. I think that's sort of how Satoshi put it, um, that it's a net positive. So I do just want to actually br break down the whole energy consumption issue because I know there is still a lot of people, some people probably watching don't really understand it. You know, we do see those major headlines um, which say, you know, I, I, even even across Europe, actually, at the moment, you know, they're talking about potentially banning um, proof of work because it's bad for the environment. So can you break down for us, you know, why it's not as bad as they say and why it's a net positive? So Bitcoin mining is a net positive for the energy usage because of, I would say, three trends. Um, the first one is the, the the amount of energy that is consumed by consumers and the community is different for every hour of the day. So in the morning and in the evenings, as humans, we all do two things. And we, we, we wake up, we make coffee. And that actually, that like energy usage, plus the heat, heat going on across all the US and the world, uh, creates a energy usage like resurgence. So people need energy. But the energy production has to match that energy consumption every single day, every single hour, every single minute, unless the grid could fail. And so what Bitcoin miners do is they help um, alleviate the peaks and valleys. So the peak would be when everyone's using energy in the morning or the evening, and the valleys would be during the day when we're not necessarily using as much energy. So Bitcoin miners, by adding more consumption to the grid, allow a utility to say, instead of having to turn on, let's say, 10 megawatts of coal plants to uh, give energy to the community, we can simply tell this Bitcoin miner, like we do in Iowa, to turn off their mining facility for that set two hours during the day, during the months where we really need it. And we can have them give the energy back to the people. So Bitcoin miners allow more renewable energy production because renewable energy production is not, um, it's not consistent. It's variable. 
And so that means you can't turn it on and off like you can with coal and natural gas, which is how we meet those demands to currently. So by being able to build more renewable energy, we're able to um, we're able to effectively ensure that the amount of energy consumed by consumers that is renewable energy is a higher percentage because now there's a, a, a large consumer of that energy. And then when that renewable energy is available and the grid needs it back, the Bitcoin miner turns off because they're financially incentivized to based on the power rate. So the power contract is set up for this to happen. Now, that right there is why Bitcoin miners and how they play into the electric grid and, and why they're beneficial and not necessarily a bad thing, because they allow us to build more renewable energy production. That's variable, which then in return allows everyone to win, including the community. And do you find yourself having to sort of explain the difference between, you know, how much energy is wasted or used compared to with Bitcoin compared to the traditional financial system? Um, I mean, do you know the stats off the top of your head? I know that. I, I don't. <laughs> okay. I, I know, I know that, I know that the traditional system and even gold, the whole entire production of gold is just so much more um, than Bitcoin. Um, well, I want to, that's, I think, I still think you're comparing, right? So when you when you start fighting that argument and you start playing, like, we're going to compare us to real estate, to gold, what we're really saying is energy usage is bad. You're still playing into their argument that energy usage is bad, but they're, we're better than them. Yeah. So the goal is not to compare energy usage at all to anyone. The goal is to say energy usage is actually a net positive for society and using energy can, can allow us to become more productive, can bring more people out of poverty and can provide more jobs and economic freedom and increased GDP. So they've seen, and there's some great articles by Nick Carter on this, that as a country uses more energy, they have a lower death rate. They have a lower uh, birth rate when it comes to deaths during you know, childbirth. They have a better um, lifestyle. They have a longer age of living. So that's one thing. Then when, in addition, there's something called the energy value. That's energy with an M. An energy value is the unit of calculation of how much energy went into an asset to create it. So the, the, one of the highest energy value assets is steel. And steel is very valuable to society. And that's why it's valuable is because you put a lot of energy into it and now people are building a building with it because it's so strong. So the same thing goes with Bitcoin. Bitcoin will has a high energy value because we're putting tons of energy into the asset itself, which then in return makes it more valuable to society. So I see Bitcoin mining as that positive feedback loop that helps ensure that every four years, the having happens, Bitcoins become harder to get. They require double the amount of energy to acquire, which then pushes the price up and provides more, more jobs, more megawatts uh, to be deployed and more mining machines working in the mines. So I think that Bitcoin's energy usage, we shouldn't compare it to other industries. Instead, we should say as a society, we should be proud of the energy we use. We should be proud of how much energy we're using and we want to use it in an environmentally friendly way. Yeah, I understand. I think that the reason people tend to do that, though, is just because it, there's like this double standard and there's this kind of concern that there's an ulterior motive going on. I mean, there seems to be such a lack of nuance, um, especially in the States with the politicians when it comes to talking about Bitcoin mining. So I wonder if you have any opinion on, you know, why there's a lack of nuance. Do you think it's just because they don't understand or do you think, you know, it's because having that nuance and, you know, having a Bitcoin friendly environment poses a threat to the US dollar and then they don't want that. Yeah, I think Bitcoin, you know, is the first thing to say, hey, we can do money without you as a state. Uh, that's why, right. you know, in 2013, I became interested in in it when I was in high school. It's for that one reason. I didn't need to ask anyone permission. I could get on Bit get get on the Bitcoin network. I could buy Bitcoin, and I could, uh, you know, transact without having to be uh, 15 years old. I could, you know, do as a as a young person. So for me, when it comes to Bitcoin mining and how the energy debate is being framed, I think it's important that um, we understand that energy creation and manufacturing, which is what Bitcoin mining is, we're manufacturing new Bitcoin, is viewed as a net positive across the world and across the United States. They Communities want manufacturing jobs. They love it. They want they want jobs. They want energy usage. They want to build their community. But when you tell them we're manufacturing Bitcoin, they're like, wait, what? There's no product there. But that doesn't mean they don't want it. When you when you talk about data centers coming in and building a data center, everyone says, yes, we want our data center. Yes, we want it. It doesn't matter that it's using energy. It doesn't matter that they have not that many jobs. We need the data centers. And so with Bitcoin mining, I think the politicians can't say, yes, it's a good thing because this is one of their key. This will be one of their key, uh, I guess, points. Of why we should regulate Bitcoin and why Bitcoin's bad is because it uses energy. 
And that's why I'm saying that debate is we need to reframe it of like energy usage isn't inherently bad. Bitcoin mining uses energy, but it also helps produce more renewable energy and allow the grid to be more uh, reliable, more sustainable and more dynamic. Without that, you don't have a grid that works. Grids have to meet consumption and production 24 seven, and you need a lot of both in order to match it up with renewable energy that's um, you know variable. Can you delve into the whole energy arbitrage thing? Because I think that is the most interesting part. Because this is the first, because this is the first time we're seeing energy decentralized, right? Yeah, effectively, Bitcoin mining is a the global buyer of energy. So anywhere in the world, you can export these electrons through the Bitcoin mining computers, which turn the electrons into heat. That's the only output. There's no radioactive material. Nothing comes out of it that's bad. There's only heat. The heat gets exhausted. And the what happens when you're creating that heat is the computers are doing a math problem. That math problem in return gets rewarded Bitcoins uh, from the pool for contributing their work to the pool or to the Bitcoin network. And that process right there is effectively taking electricity that's stranded, that's in the Midwest, that's has nowhere to go. We're looking at uh, some wind farms and a few of them generate energy in 75% of the time. They're putting the energy in the ground because they can't mm. actually get it on the transmission line. The transmission line is already full. No one needs it. But that project that I'm talking about has been there for 12, 13 years. And so it's already paid off. The investors are already done. Now it's like we're going to you know, dismantle it or we don't need it anymore. And so the fact is, is that there's plenty of energy. The problem is the energy is not in the right spot because it's hard to transmit energy. We have less transmission lines here in the United States because it's, it, we incentivize energy production with like green energy credits and RECs, and, um, but we don't incentivize transmission of energy or consumption of energy. You, know, you don't get paid to consume energy. What happens if you did? Well, as a Bitcoin miner, you do get paid to use energy and you're selling that energy to the Bitcoin network and that's the one paying you. So Bitcoin provides this um, almost like what I would call like basic um, wealth, a universal basic income to anyone who wants to plug a computer in and wants to arbitrage energy. And so with Mining Store, we're working on getting the lowest cost energy so that the people on our platform can arbitrage the energy at two or three cents to the, to the Bitcoin network and make, you know, and sell it for 25 cents, 30 cents, 40 cents, whatever the Bitcoin price is, and get that arbitrage all day long and never have to actually go to the facility and work and plug in the machines and deal with the noise. We don't, we don't want that. We just want them to say, okay, get on a hundred dollar level, be able to quickly get an allocation to the space and do it through software because that's the future of, of Bitcoin mining as we see it for consumers. Yeah, I really want to do this. I have to get involved. Um, when, I think it was about a year ago, Elon Musk, was it a year ago? No, nearly. It was about May last year or maybe even April to be honest. Elon Musk made that whole U-turn with Tesla because of the, his environmental concerns. How, um, how genuine do you, do you think his environmental concerns were? I think Elon's a very smart guy. Um, as you saw with his tweet, even he's like, we need to ramp up natural gas and oil production in the US. Yes. Like, I can't believe I'm saying this. But um, the thing is, is Elon has people who he needs to, you know, keep his friends. And when you're getting hundreds of millions and billions of dollars of tax credits and, um, re and you know, renewable energy advocates and battery storage credits and all the, the tax advantages he's getting, the, the face of only clean energy that Elon puts on, you know, he has to maintain it. And with Bitcoin mining, I think he got a knock on the door from someone and said, Hey, you can't, you can't be saying this. Like you guys bought Bitcoin. That was already enough. Now you're coming out and saying Bitcoin mining is good. That doesn't fit our agenda. That's my personal opinion. And I think he knows the fact that as a society, we need to use more energy. And he's heard of the, those theories and that he understands that he wants to make it more clean energy. And Bitcoin mining is one way to increase adoption of clean energy and grid reliability. Yeah, it's interesting. I tend to think that he, I think it was just a mistake. Like, because I, I, I feel like, okay, I could be totally wrong, but I feel, I feel he's a bit of an, I do think he's kind of honest. Um, you know, I don't think he's one of those shady characters. I mean, you never really know, do you? Um, but I tend to think he's more of an honest one. Um, and I feel it was just a mistake. He didn't really understand it. It's why it took, it took him so long to get involved. Um, you know, I, I think it was just a mistake. I'm not really sure. Um, but it is interesting. And, you know, where do you, where do you then see this going over the next 10 years? Um, you know, I feel like we're in the middle of this battle right now. Um, you know, climate change, their narrative around climate change is certainly heating up. Um, 
you know, to what extent do you think Bitcoin is going to take the brunt of it? To what extent do I think Bitcoin is going to take the brunt of what again? Of this climate change narrative that's heating up. I think, I mean, Bitcoin will be in front and center in the climate change debate as we just continue to move forward and as society progresses because it uses so much energy. And I think Bitcoin, what we're seeing now is it's actually becoming a feature to the energy companies. So the energy companies who own the energy assets are looking to build Bitcoin mines at their facilities when they can't sell their power to the grid. And so now the, the, the big players are coming in per se. Like right now it's been the small guys and it's been, if you didn't have really cheap energy, it was hard to compete. But now that Bitcoin is where it's at and the price point, it's been stable. The market is changing. The market has a problem where there's too much production and not enough consumption. And I think the market will dictate um, the Bitcoin mining like deployments in the US regarding the policy discussion and the news cycle. I, I, we've seen Bitcoin mining you know, be pronounced dead hundreds of times. I think we're going to see Bitcoin mining's energy usage be continued to be debated. And there has to be more research and more community effort to bring awareness to energy usage being an inherently good thing and not bad. Yeah, I think El Salvador is obviously this kind of experiment slash shining light slash something, something that's going on right now. Um, you know, it is, an, it is an experiment and it is like some shining light when it comes to, you know, innovation. Um, so the volcanoes are really interesting. Have you had a chance to check them out yet? I, I have never been to the volcanoes, but I have um, had conversations with parties who are mining crypto in El Salvador. Uh, we consult with a few groups down there um, and we, you know, we are reviewing geothermal as an energy source and how to, in, you know, how to drill geothermal wells to generate clean energy. As I see, it's one of the best ways to generate a, renew a renewable energy that's 24 seven. And so I think it's applications for Bitcoin mining are tremendous. Do you think like the US is ever going to do something similar? You know, the way they've built what they've built, you know, with the government backing, um, you know, it, it's just so crazy. Well, the US, I think, takes the position of let's let the private companies generate the energy and uh, sell them to the grid. And, and in, in the energy companies, their goal is not to uh, to get the rate the consumer pays to be lower. The goal of the energy company is to get more assets on their balance sheet to pay bigger debts and interest so that their consumer, the person who's buying the power, has to pay uh, for those fees so that they can get more assets on the uh, utilities balance sheet. So at the end of the day, we are making geothermal energy in the United States. We are there's plants that do it in California. Um, and I don't I see that we need more clean energy throughout the world and we need more nuclear. We need more um, geothermal. And I realize even things like hydro, you consider that renewable energy, but that has um, a ton of the, the, the water that's stable and is, is like stale actually causes like CO2 emissions and has, uh, you know, biogas and uh, different types of issues with it. So um, I think the geothermal and nuclear path are a great way for us to deploy a lot of energy, but it's not what we're looking at. We're looking at solar and wind because it's um, being subsidized by the government where geothermal is not. I'm with you. Um, you're also the founder of Aram Capital Ventures. Am I even pronouncing that correctly? That's correct. So tell, tell me about that. Where does that fit into everything? Yeah, so that's the parent company that we have right. that owns uh, every different LLC we have. So we're in the mining space. We're also in the helium space. We're launching a helium um, a miner, which is the, the people's internet. Um, we are in, um, we're in the consulting space. We have different product lines. We're in the software space. So we separate each one of our companies out underneath it and build brands for like the mining store and for BitVault based on what the consumer or who the audience is. And Orem Capital Ventures is the parent company, which uh, we receive investment into and which our employees gain shares from or you know get, get option contracts and kind of vest into and get ownership in it. So what's the overall goal for you? Because you obviously, you know, you started this in 2017, which actually somebody tweeted the, uh, today saying 2017 is five years ago, which is actually insane that it's five years ago. So it's, time, is, time is getting on. So what's, you know, the next big thing? Are you just going to be dedicating your career and your life to mining? Or are you looking at any, anything else? Are you interested in proof of stake? You know, what else? So I like stake, but not proof of stake. Um, I'm dedicating... <laughs> I'm dedicating my, you know, my resources and time and talent to making Bitcoin mining more accessible to everyone. So anyone can get into the space, making Bitcoin mining um, 
cheaper for the energy. So working on figuring out what's the best energy mix. How do I get the lowest cost energy? And I love the energy space. I love building massive buildings. I love construction. And then I love software because I was a computer science major in school. And I'm realizing that to make an impact on the world, you need to you know, have a radical idea. And for me, that radical idea is energy usage is a good thing. And let's incentivize energy usage, flip the argument on its head. And let's show off you know, how much energy Layla and her Bitcoin miners and her whole community is using. And let's comp have her compete with, you know, Natalie or with Josh Terry or with Mr. Beast who had a Bitcoin mine. So there's all these influencers who have mined Bitcoin in the past. They might not have told you about it or they're currently mining crypto. And we want to make it a public thing that um, we share like a social media for influencers to focus on finances and raising money through the regulated crowdfunding framework. I think that framework is going to change how we sell our time. So, you know, most people sell their time for money. I think in the future we should sell our time for equity. And I think everyone should have a regulated crowdfund that they own and they can create content about an industry and get their fans to put money into it, to be owners with them. And they get to build really cool things uh, with their fans. So that's what, what I'm excited for, what I'm eager to build. And, you know, the journey is just starting um, in, this, in the software space for us. And it's also interesting because, you know, you have to have a huge, you know, desire for decentralization and love for decentralization in order to sort of, you know, devote a career and to build everything that you're building. So I'd like to understand where that interest comes from. You know, what what is it about decentralization and what is it about Bitcoin for you, um, you know, that has allowed you to dedicate so much time, energy and, you know, all these resources to it? So what I would say for me is that underlying um, belief that, you know, money is by the people for the people and money should work for you and not against you. When I make the decision to hold U.S. dollars in my bank account or to transact in U.S. dollars, I'm effectively saying that the, you know, I'm using money that is depreciating in value. When I'm using Bitcoin, I'm using money that is the, the best store of value in the world that you know, was created with tons of energy and that is inherently valuable. That's the belief that keeps me going all day long. The belief that no one should be able to tell you based on your race, your age, your religion, if you can or can't do a transaction. I think that we all should have that. That should be a, a God-given right. And that's what I'm looking to build on top of, which is not only should we receive, be able to use these networks, we should have these networks work for us. And Bitcoin mining put out $25 billion last year in mining revenue. And we want to get that into the people's hands. We want to get as many consumers mining Bitcoin at, an, at a $100 price point and becoming um, you know, opening up that, that gate of wealth, creating uh, freedom for those individuals, showing them that you can create money through the Bitcoin mining process and you can come out at the end of the day with more Bitcoin than you had, uh, you know, getting into the investment or mining with, without, with, you know, without starting mining. So that's, that's the end goal. The end goal is to give people that flexibility, freedom that I got to experience and I get to experience in my life because I was able to be on this techno technological trend you know, earlier than most. The thing is, you got into it in 2016, 17. So you must have been around 18 or 19. So I got into at crypto in 2013, but then mining 2016. Okay. So what? Well, that, okay. Wow. That's even younger. How old are you in 2013? I think we're a similar age. I was like so... 14. I'm 24 now. Oh, okay. You, you, you weren't 14 in 2013. I was you older. 15, 14, right? 15. I'm 24 now. 15 and 20. It's like 2022. Oh my God. Okay. Right. I'm trying to get <laughs> so I was 15, 15 years old over here and there we go. Know, 15, 15. Yeah. Not loving, 13. Loving, yeah. Loving crypto. Yeah. But so, but the thing is, it must have been, it must have been the tech. Like that's why you got oh, into it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was so I in high school, I was taking like macro and microeconomic classes and I like loved that. And I was like Byzantine generals theory, like why does Bitcoin work? And I was the kid, I went to a small high school, 50 people per class. And I was the kid who just told everyone about Bitcoin, got my teachers into it. And now it's the running joke. Like when I go back to speak at schools, yeah. they're like, oh my God, like we should have bought Bitcoin. And then same thing in college. Like that's just who I've been because I'm obsessed with the technology. And also I'm weird enough where I'll state my facts and opinions and be like, I don't have to be the normal one. I don't have to believe what everyone else is believing. And I'll be the guy that's like, hey, you should buy Bitcoin at $70 a coin to my family. And now I'm the same guy here pitching the same stuff. It's because I truly believe with my heart that Bitcoin is the best thing for the world. 
when it comes to money and it's the best money for the world. It's freedom. And so that's why I'm working on building products that kind of let people get out of that nine to five job, let them get out of that uh, confused state where they're barely making it by. My goal is to build wealth for society. And I want to do build wealth through clean energy and Bitcoin mining, which are both massive industrial processes. Infrastructure builds wealth. And there's plenty of uh, good research on showing that infrastructure builds society and builds GDP. And I think Bitcoin mining, clean energy has the ability to do that for communities across the globe. But when did you, my question is like, when did you have that realization? Because you, you were the guy that was in it for the tech, right? And now you're in it for the freedom. And I do think, well, I w- I think there's I was, a difference there. I, for me, I think I started with the freedom, right? So the reason why- I No, you into- started with the tech. You were like the nerdy kid. You were just saying that was telling your teachers to buy it for 70 cents. Yeah, well, so I'm telling them to buy it for $70, but why am I interested in it? Oh, $70. I'm, I'm interested in it because no one can tell me what I can't do, right. can and can't do, which is- But how do you have that realization at 15? You read Wikipedia and you realize that, okay. like, I mean, for me, like, I'm trying to think back then, I- There was I no just, issues back when we were 15. We're like a similar age. There were no issues when we were 15. I remember when I was 15 thinking the world was you, so easy. People told you you couldn't do something. And I didn't like that. I was defying that. Like, as a, since a young kid, I've always defined, defied, like, societal standards of, like, what's okay with school. and like, like, what? Do you have an example? Like, what? For example, like, the first day of high school, the first, second day of high school or, or second year of high school, I, they had a, a rule book. I went to an early college so we could leave the college campus and they, if we didn't have class. And so I read both the rule books and I was like, here's the rules. You guys just put it out. We just all signed it. Here's the other rules. Therefore, I don't have a class. I'm not going to be counted absent. So I'm going to leave. It's like that was my mentality as a sophomore in high school. And like in middle school, I was, you know, always trying to figure out how to how to build this next thing, like starting robotics camp. I'm always trying to 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 basically innovate and build value for people, because at a young age, I had this 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 like this not discernment, but this vision of like, hey, you need to uh, pay for your own shit. Like you need to you need to create value in the world for my dad. And so as a 15 year old, I'm trying to solve my financial problems. And then I've realized like, okay, how do you do that effectively? Well, I'm not going to sell my time. I'm going to build businesses. And so that belief in that structure, being a business owner, I've never had guardrails, right? I dropped out of school. So like we had the guardrails. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. Same thing with business. Like you have the guardrails, but in the business, the guardrails are really, really broad and you can play in that space. So I've always been someone to play in that uh, arena because I believe that, you know, Bitcoin is, uh, life-changing technology because it is a free it's freedom freedom for the world freedom for everyone and it's the the protocol you know the trust protocol as we would call it or as mark Yusko would say selling um not selling time for dollars is um it sounds really obvious but i definitely think it's like a, an advanced sort of mentality that not the average person um is sort of aware of so did your dad teach you that or is that something you read or you came across or realized on your own it's something that i i I think I believe I, I developed it. Like I read the four hour work week over time. I was always Thank trying you. to create value by, by being an arbitrage. So like by selling the strawberries or by robotics camp, the way I positioned that in my brain was like, okay, if I can get a, 10 kids at $15 an hour or $10 an hour, that's $150 or 15, you know, 15 kids at $15 an hour, then like that's going to be um, more effective than me working at 12 hour dollars an hour at a job. So like, that's when I started comparing, like, okay, I can get 10 X my revenue here. And then eventually you're like, okay, I won't sell my time for money at all. I'm only interested in building equity. And that's what I want to help the world get to is that belief that they want to be an owner in their company. They want to sell equity and selling your time for dollars is secure. It it gives you that sense of security, but it doesn't give you that it's fake. It's fake, right? It's not, it's not real. So why do you do what you do today? I'm curious now. To hear me your oh god what's the question <laughs> so why are you in crypto and what are your beliefs behind it oh well i'm a diehard freedom maximalist don't tell me what to do i'm competent on my own i don't need the daddy government to tell me what to do um look like i think i think that um humans can truly prosper um once they're left to prosper on their own right like it's kind of like a we're like plants um, and you know, if you keep, if you keep like over, over nurturing the plant and you keep doing too much to it, I think it will die. If you just yeah. give it, you know, the correct environment, um, I think it can flourish and be very beautiful. Um, and I, th- I really believe in like personal responsibility and that's what I love about Bitcoin. Um, because so I, I, I've kind of like taken Bitcoin to the extreme. So like, you know, the whole idea of like, don't, um, don't trust verify. Mm-hmm. I now like double check everything in my life you know 
everything you know have have a backup plan be you know really verify don't trust that that's going to work out like so i just i just sort of feel we should um you know empower people to take personal responsibility i think that um you know governments are too uh act like a nanny state too much and i think that that um i think that that disempowers people um so and was that yeah, I mean, created I could... by society or your parents like how did you come up with that belief as well that's a great question. Um, I know you asked my- me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Um, I think that, well, firstly, my, I have an older brother. He's two years older than me and he definitely sort of red pilled me if you like. Um, but just overall, I think that, um, you know, I sort of just seen that things aren't going to be handed to you. Um, and you have to just sort of, you can get anything you want as long as, as long as you create it. Um, and you know, as well, like if you, if you rely on the government, you're only going to get X far, but if you rely on yourself, you'll get much further because you have all the control, like you have all the control over everything. So you really can pull as many strings as you like, right? You can call the shots and you can create as much as you want. If you Mm -hmm. have to rely on a government or something like that, then you're, you're kind of, you're stuck in a box. And then also I think like governments are corrupt and so on and so on. But anyway, this is like, I, I don't want to talk all about me. <laughs> well, that, this, so there's, so there's this theory called, I watched a, a documentary called hyper normalization. And yeah. the fact, the belief is, is like, we are currently know the system's broken. Like society yeah. is realizing today, especially with the war, that the system is breaking, is broken. And we're all just acting like everything's okay. Mm. and we all are aware that everyone else has no idea what they're doing. Everyone else is acting, and there's this thing called inflation that just keeps on uh, digging away at everything we're trying to buy and making it more expensive. So the people are going to continue to wake up because their standard of living is getting crushed right now, and they're going to be asking for where is a monetary supply that I can put my capital into that is different than this fake money that we're all believing exists and the prices keep going up every day. With the internet, with the, how fast TikTok and Instagram can push uh, media and news, I see an advent where now we have an opportunity to opt out. And it's plan B, it's Bitcoin. Yeah, it's really exciting. And I think that um, right now we're in this really weird kind of push and pull phase um, because like, you know, there's so much to Bitcoin and it's not just, you know, opting out. Like there is this kind of entrepreneurial side of it just because it does require you to take personal responsibility, um, you know, over, over your keys, over your finances. It's just a mentality. But the, uh, the other side of the coin is that we also live in a world where some people just, I, I mean, I, I don't know if this is true, but I'm just going to sort of say it. Some people just sort of aren't built that way. Um, you know, some people prefer security. Some people prefer. Um, we all you know, prefer security. Mm, okay. Yes, but we, but we, but what we, what we perceive as secure is different, right? Like you and I, I would think the nine to five is really dangerous. Yeah, I would agree with that. But we all have these natural yeah. rights that we're looking to uh, in, ensure. And you know, for me, that's 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 cash flow for for anyone. That's cash flow. That's ensuring that they have uh, something set away for the future. And that they know they're not going to have to work their, their whole life. Um, the thing the thing about Bitcoin is that you know with the, with the internet anyone can access these beliefs now, and we can express these beliefs like we are today. And before that, it, the information just didn't get out as fast. And now with Bitcoin, you can own part of the protocol. And like I said, no one has to ask for permission, so it's exploding across the world. And uh, I I am excited to be building alongside people like yourself who are really passionate as well and sharing the message because. It's important. It's important that it's out there because there's plenty of people saying Bitcoin mining energy usage is bad and someone has to sell it, tell them it's not. And it's here for the betterment of society. Absolutely. Just one last question then. Um, how, how religious would you say Bitcoin is? And the reason I ask this is because, um, so I don't believe, I don't think it's like religious in terms of like, you know, a, a cult or anything like that, you know, but I, I think it's kind of like religious in terms of like you dedicate your life to an idea, an idea that people should take personal responsibility, people should be free, people should be sovereign, um, and people should be independent um, from, um, you know, government systems. Um, and then you sort of build your life around this, you know, whether it's, you know, your social life, probably is your social life, you know, dating life, work life, you know, everything about your life is really surrounded by this philosophy and this ideology. Um, so yeah, how, how sort of religious would you say it is? So I think Bitcoin is, uh, religious in the sense that it, it maintains this pretense of a way that society can function. 
So mm-hmm. it creates this delusion, which at the end of the day becomes a self-fulfilling pro- pro- prophecy of um, a new way of doing business, a new way of control, a new belief that this is how it should be. So we're, we're basically the dollar and the euro and these things that we believe in are created because of a mass hallucination between millions of individuals that say, yes, this thing exists, but the dollar, it it doesn't exist. It exists because it affects our world and it has momentum and it means something to everyone in the world. We decide to trade our time for that dollar. But if you take away the dollars being worth anything and that they're just pieces of paper, we are no longer going to trade our time for that. So I believe that Bitcoin is the same way where it is a mass hallucination. And the goal is to get as many people believers into the hallucination because it's yeah. better for them. It's better for society if we run on Bitcoin than if we run on dollars. It's like, And it's how a, long do you think until we're a society that runs on Bitcoin? I think we need to clarify that farther. I would say if you can clarify as a society that runs on Bitcoin being 50% of the transactions are happening in Bitcoin, uh, like 100 years. I think it's going to take a long time to get there. Yeah. But that's where we're here and we're building for the future that, you know, our kids will experience in, in the world. I think um, I tend to agree, but I think it'll be much faster. Um, and the reason I think it'll be much faster is because life is crazy right now. Like we like, I, I didn't. Yeah, well, I did an interview with Mark Moss last week and he was talking about like peak centralization coming at like 2025. Um, and I think once that happens, that's when we so go on to the Bitcoin standard. Here's why I disagree with you. Okay. The amount of bonds traded in US dollars is insane. Trillions of yeah. dollars. It makes anything on the Bitcoin network look small. So this whole financial system of financialization of assets in oil and gas and real estate uh, is, is massively big. And that's what made me believe that money doesn't exist. That money is a complete hallucination that even trading your time for $1,000 an hour is still not worth it. And you should be building equity in a business that you own because the amount of dollars created in the financials, financial markets through these ways of seasoning debt and doing these interesting, intricate financial transactions make a day-to-day consumer purchase, even a real estate purchase, look so small, look insignificant, buying a half a million dollar home because of the scale and size of these papers that are being pushed. And I'm sold. with you. Okay, JP, um, where can people follow you, um, get involved with your work, um, you know, the mining store, how can people get involved? Sure. So you can reach out to us at sales at if you're interested in uh, getting mining. You can check out the miningstore.com website. You can message me or check, follow me on Twitter at JP Barrick, on Instagram at John Paul Barrick, that's B-A-R-I-C, on TikTok as JP Barrick. And if you're looking to work with a great team and help build the vision, you can email us at hiring at miningstore.com. And we're always looking for uh, great people to work with. Sounds amazing. Well, JP, I want to thank you so much. It's been so interesting hearing your perspective on Bitcoin, life, entrepreneurship. Um, It's the perfect match for my show. So it's really great having you on. Thank you so much. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And guys, please don't forget to hit the subscribe button, hit the like button so you never miss um, one of my brilliant guests. And we will see you all next week.